We are going to be uh, just jumping right in. Uh, the sermon's a little bit longer than, uh, than I normally like to do. Sorry for those who need to get out of here. But uh, let's go ahead and jump right in this evening. I was doing some reading this week and came across uh, some ideas about shadows and reflections and looking in mirrors and how that relates spiritually speaking. And I thought it would uh, be a good thing for us to look at because I think there's some, some important implication with the way that we view the world, the way that we see things. And this relates a little bit to what we talked about this morning in our sermon about being disciples and following Jesus and what all that means, what we are giving up to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, tonight could probably be seen as a little bit of an extension of that idea. Look at a couple of passages with me this evening. Colossians chapter 2. We'll start here, Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read verse 16 and 17. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink, or in the matter of a festival, new moon, or a Sabbath day. They are shadows of what, is to, or what was to come. The substance is Christ. Here you have this idea of shadows, of something in the future, shadows of, of, you know, essentially something that is kind of in the form of something that is yet to be fully revealed. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of your uh, maybe sitting on a, a park bench in the evening and suddenly you see a shadow starting to walk towards you and you can, you can tell a lot of things from the shadow. You might be able to tell if it's a male or a female, uh, you might, or an animal, or whatever is making the shadow. Even if it's a human, you can you can kind of get a sense of what they're wearing. Are they wearing a hat? You know, what are they? You know, kind of how they carry themselves. But you don't really see the real thing until the person comes around the corner. The person gets an eyesight, and that's kind of how shadows are used in Scripture. This idea of it's a glimpse of the real thing. You can. You can see a little bit, you can kind of see the form of it, you can see the basic idea, but you don't see the real thing until what makes the shadow is revealed. All of these festivals and these, these special requirements that they had in the old law, they were, in a sense, a shadow of the real thing, of Christ himself, of what Christ established through the new covenant. Now, Hebrews chapter 8 uses this idea of shadows again in a little bit of a different way. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. These serve, talking about the, the, the high priest and the priest and the priesthood and those things in the old law, these serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said... Be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. So all of the things that you have in the old law, the, the, the tabernacle, later the temple, the sacrifices, the way the priesthood worked, they are all shadows of the things in heaven. You skip over a page, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year by year. Notice, we always talk about the idea of it's because the, the old sacrifices weren't sufficient because they were the blood of bulls and goats. It goes on to say that down in verse 4. But the other reason they weren't really sufficient is because those sacrifices were only a shadow of the real sacrifice that was intended to take away sin. It was a mimicking. It was a, a kind of a pseudo picture, right? It's not quite the real thing. That's what shadows are. When you, as you look through Scripture, which I want to do this evening in this lesson, you find that much of what we have been given on earth is merely a reflection of the real thing. The real thing that we have in heaven. That all that we have on earth, all the blessings we enjoy, 
as great and wonderful as those blessings are, they are insufficient. They are only a glimpse of what the reality is, which is the blessings we enjoy in heaven. If you take nothing else from tonight's lesson, that's the main idea I want you to walk away with. That what we enjoy, all the blessings, all the good we have on this earth, and we're going to talk about some of those things, they are mere glimpses of the good we will get to experience when we walk into reality, when we walk into the real thing, when we actually finally get to heaven. And it's kind of like seeing things in a mirror. Our mirrors are pretty good, if we keep them clean, that's, that's kind of key there. But our mirrors work really well. You walk into your bathroom, and it looks like another you is plastered, is, is, is moving on the wall, right? It, it, it looks and mimics your movement. It's exactly what you look like. But you've got to remember, mirrors haven't always been like that. Mirrors, many years ago, showed the form of the thing or gave a general picture of the thing. You might have a shiny piece of brass that's been flattened out and it gives you an idea of what you look like, but the color's off because their mirrors didn't work like our mirrors. You look at your reflection down in the water and while you get a, a good picture of what you look like, as soon as the water moves, what happens to the picture? It messes up. The idea of seeing in mirrors, you get to see a copy of the real thing. You get to see a kind of glimpse of what the real thing is supposed to look like. And I want to work with that idea, with that image, as we go through different uh, blessings that we experience here on earth. For instance, we get to see reflections of or shadows of glory. We already looked at Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and 17. It talked about festivals and new moons and Sabbath and food and drink that they would use in their celebrations and their festivals. That was a very common thing to, to have those celebratory moments or those memorial moments as a part of Jewish culture and even as a part of Greek culture. But as great as those things were, you know, we, we go back and we read things like uh, the way that they celebrated Passover, and we're like, that would be so cool, right? It would be so neat to go through that whole celebration and all the ritual attached to that. You know, the, the Feast of Booths, I'm not a camper. So the idea of going and living in a tent for several days in a row is like, yeah, I, I'm kind of glad that one disappeared. But, I mean, just the... The family festival uh, arrangement of that particular uh, event would have been really fascinating. And all of the things that they did and the things they ate and the things they remembered and the scriptures they read were all just glimpses of how good things can be. Same's true about creation itself, isn't it? Well, we've got creation itself, which is, which is designed to cause us to seek more good things. Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2. The heavens declare the handiwork of God, and the firmaments declare, let me get to it here, uh, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hand. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. You look at creation, you look at the way the heavens move, you look at the way the earth moves and all the things and how it all works. It, it's fascinating because it makes us realize the, the handiwork of, of right? We look at creation and we realize this could not have been an accident. This is absolutely amazing. But it makes us want to learn more about God. That's what we're told over in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that we see the, the glory of God in the creation and the way things are made. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Here we're told in verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. When he went out, 
even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in a land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. Now listen to this. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundation, his, whose architect and builder is God. Now here's the thing. We don't know how much Abraham knew about heaven. We don't have any sort of documentation of a law that he had received. We don't know exactly what God revealed other than the pieces that we have in the book of Genesis. But somehow, Abraham traveled from his home to the home God was giving him, living in tents the entire rest of his life, and it caused him to seek a city or a place that had a foundation that was built by God. He wasn't satisfied with tarps and tent posts. He was satisfied because he knew he had a God who was preparing a place for him. And I find that amazing, that that kind of faith is built off of the observation of what God had already blessed him with, that, that he saw his surroundings, he saw his circumstances, and it caused him to seek something more. That's kind of the way... We are. That's what it's supposed to do for us. Look with me over in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'll let you all off easy this morning, just turning to passages in Matthew, you know, kind of in order, right? That, that, was, that was easy. Tonight I'm giving your fingers and your pages a workout. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Who in here hasn't marveled at a sunset and thought if God could do that here, imagine what he has done there. Who in here hasn't looked at the beauty of spring and see how the earth essentially resurrects every single year from the bleakness of winter to the beauty of spring and not marveled and thought if God can bring such vibrance to our world now, imagine what we're going to get to walk into one day in heaven. That's what our creation is supposed to do for us. It's supposed to make us marvel because this creation, as beautiful and lovely and satisfying as it is, is merely a shadow of things to come. It is the form or just a glimpse at what God is capable of. And if we marvel that much of a shadow... Imagine how exciting it will be to see the real thing. How wonderful it will be to walk through those gates and see things that are beyond our imagination and go so far beyond anything that we could ever think or believe was possible. Our worship is a reflection of what is possible. I mean, who loves to come in here and worship? I mean, we, we come and we blend our voices and we sing songs and, and, and we, we, we get to hear the messages of those songs, which are often encouraging or challenging, and they, they go and, and they make us want to be more than what we, than we, than we are. They, they, they kind of call us to the line, onward Christian soldiers, right? Or Rabbani, which we just sang, which Gibson and I kind of have a, a, a fun relationship about. Because he loves that song. And, and it, it, it's a wonderful depiction of, of Mary turning around and, and, and recognizing Jesus. And all of a sudden, everything she couldn't imagine was suddenly true. 
that Jesus had come back, that Jesus was still alive, and she, she cries out, Rabbanai. And just, just we sing these songs, and they get us excited about what's possible. But they are only a glimpse. It's only a glimpse. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. says here in verse 5 and 6, these serve as a copy. We already read this. They serve as a copy, a shadow of heavenly things. Verse 6, but Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. You know, as 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 amazing as it would have been to see the, the incense burning and the, the lamps lit up and the sacrifices outside the temple and the beauty of the, of the golden walls that were decorated and carved with different angels and almond blossoms and all of these things that you have there in the Old Testament, they are a shadow of what's to come. As beautiful as our worship is, as much as we enjoy it, as much as we love blending voices and bowing heads together and coming together and enjoying this time of reflection and thinking about God, it is a shadow of better things. Because it's limited. But what is it that heaven is described as? God's people gathered where? God's throne. God's throne. Now again, we have to picture things physically. So what it's really like, we don't know. It is, again, beyond our imagining. But thinking of it in physical terms, can you imagine literally being in a crowd of saints and in front of you there is the throne of God and above it you've got a rainbow that encircles it and you've got this, this beautiful pic, you know, God sitting there in your presence, and you are getting to shout praises to him. Does that not thrill you? And that is, again, a glimpse of reality, a shadow of just how amazing it's actually going to be. And the relationships that we enjoy here as God's people, they are a shadow of what's possible. And the relationship that we have with God right now because we are separated and we are physical and he is spiritual and, and he exists in a in really a different plane than we do in ways that we can't understand. And we know that one day, John tells us, we will know him as he is because we will be like he is. That That's thrilling that we get to have that revelation, that understanding that reality one day. We're told over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we, well, turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this passage thrills me too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I better calm down. So uh, verse 16, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet we no longer know him in this way, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away and new things have come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God was making his appeal to us. Therefore, we plead on, God, on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Why don't you notice that beginning section? Because I don't know that that actually describes me. We no longer recognize one another from a worldly perspective. Yeah, we do. I'll be honest, I think we have a hard time picturing or thinking about one another from any other perspective. We see flesh. 
And Paul says we should see spirit. One day, we will. One day, we will. We will learn to see people as souls, not as humans. I love that. I love that at some point we will start to see people for who they truly are, the creation of God, those eternal beings that God has made so that we might be loved by him. We will learn to see the real person, not the outer covering. We experience reflections of holiness right now. I'm convinced the longer we live on this earth, the more we realize this, is, this just isn't our home. This isn't where we belong. We, we get a sense or a longing that grows in us because we realize there is something better than this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw the things that were promised from a great or from a distance greeted them and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Do you hear that? When we finally come to recognize that this world is not our home, that we, are, we don't belong here, that we should have something else, then, then we come to realize there's a homeland waiting for us. Verse 16, but they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. When we realize that this world is not our home, we quit living for this world. We stop trying to satisfy the flesh and satisfy people who are fleshly, and we start living for a different world that, that, that requires us to live holy lives because we don't belong here. We start living for a home that doesn't have troubles like this one does. We experience pain and heartbreak and, and, and heartache and, and, and loss and, and just, just all the bad stuff. As good as this world can be, it's filled with plenty of bad. You know why? Because the bad reminds us that we don't belong here. We've got something better waiting for us. We'll just keep our eyes on Him. Heavenly minded people pursue heaven's things, which includes holiness. So heavenly-minded people long for holiness, and they quit trying to pursue what the world says we should pursue, which is the pursuit of happiness. Heaven is better than this place. And we need to learn to see it for what it is and what a great opportunity God has given us. You know, on this earth, we merely get reflections of God's love. Now, this is a little bit of a, of a weird one. But turn with me over to John chapter 1, verse 18. We, we talk about God's love as if we know it completely. That, that love is, is, you know, God is love, therefore we know love. And yes, there's some truth to that. Absolutely. But it's interesting to me over in John chapter 1, verse 18, at the end of the prologue there, there's no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and at the Father's side. He has revealed him. He's revealed him. God is what? Love. Jesus came to reveal God and love. And even though he did, he showed us what love was really about, and we're going to look at a verse or two about that in just a second. 
because we have not seen God, we do not yet truly know love. We see glimpses of it. Jesus is one of those glimpses. What is it John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him might not perish but would inherit eternal life. 1 John 3.16, similar message. This is how we've come to know love. He laid down his life for us. So could we really know love before Jesus revealed the Father and thereby revealed love? I'm not sure we could. I'm not sure we could have had any inkling of just how far love goes. Then it goes on in the same verse to say, we should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So here we've got this principle of it's not just about knowing God's love, but it's about learning how to display God's love. How do we do that? By mimicking Jesus, by doing the things Jesus did, by living sacrificially like he did. Chapter 4, verse 10. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And so again, we've got this idea of, of we come to know love because God, who is love, displayed his love through Jesus. And it's by understanding and knowing and, and, and recognizing the story of Jesus that we learn to love. And that, that makes love possible in our world. But then we have to also share it with others. And the more we know God, the more we will know love. So here's, here's my premise. Will we know God more now, or will we know God more there? There. Because We don't quite yet understand how all this works, and who God is, and exactly how God is, but we will then. And then we will truly know love. Ooh, that did not go well. But let me, let me use this as an illustration. The last book of the Narnia series by C.S. Lewis tells the story of the Narnia, or the children who have visited Narnia, coming to Narnia, or they visited what they thought was Narnia. But they come to what's called Aslan's Country, which is essentially the place that allows them to enter in to meet the emperor. The emperor is the, the, uh, the father figure, the god figure in the story, Aslan being the Christ figure in the story. And there are certain statements made here that just absolutely put heaven and the shadow of this world in perspective. One of the characters is a unicorn named Bree, I think. Uh, but the unicorn says this, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Breehee, come further up, come further in. You hear that little piece in there? The reason why we loved old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Brothers and sisters, you know the reason why we sometimes love this earth is because sometimes it looks a little, a little bit. We get a little glimpse of just how good heaven is. The best things on earth are glimpses of heaven. Also in the same book, there's a professor, and the professor makes this statement. It is as hard to explain how this sunlit land was different from the old Narnia as it would be to tell you how the fruits of that country taste. Perhaps you'll get some idea of it if you think like this. 
you may have been in a room where there was a window that looked out onto a lovely bay of a sea or a green valley that wound away among mountains. And in the wall of that room, opposite to the window, there may have been a looking glass, a mirror. As you turned away from the window, you suddenly caught sight of that sea or that valley all over again in the looking glass. And the sea in the mirror or the valley in the mirror were in one sense just the same as the real one. Yet at the same time, they were somehow different, deeper, more wonderful, more like places in a story, in a story you've never heard but very much want to know. The difference between the old Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you'll know what I mean. Now I'm going to flip that on its head a little bit because I think the bigger picture is not the one you see in the mirror. The reason the professor is saying that's the better picture is because that's the picture of the unknown. That's the picture of the story world. I'm going to flip it. The real picture, this earth is merely the reflection in the mirror. And we have an opportunity to experience the real thing. And here's the way I would kind of lay this out because it helps me to make sense of how our world works. Seeing in the mirror, what we see in the mirror is merely, this, it's what we experience on a daily basis. It's merely an image, a glimpse. Turning around and seeing the real thing is the church. So you can choose to look in the mirror and see some good. It's a small picture, small mirror. You're only going to get a small glimpse of what's real and what's possible. But when you find yourself in the church, you get to see the real thing. But it's not complete yet. It's just, again, a more complete picture of what God has made possible. Pursuing the real thing, being willing to walk out the door into that bay, into the sunset, that is our pursuing real things, what we call sanctification. And stepping into the real thing is heaven. As long as you remain in the room looking at the mirror, you will never get the experience that God wants you to have. But if you're willing to turn around and see what's possible in front of you and take the journey that is required in order to get there, can you imagine the experience of, of the reality of that beautiful and amazing place? Now, this earth has little glimpses of what is true. Beautiful sunset, wonderful smells, things that taste great, relationships that we enjoy, triumphant moments that bring us happiness. Glimpses. And the church is the place you can go to experience those things more fully. All of that is designed to help you want to be in the real place where there is limitless joy and satisfaction in good things coming. And that place lasts forever. I love that God has given us the opportunity to experience the real thing. Because can you imagine as good as seeing God's glory is now and worship is now and relationships are now and the pursuit of holiness is now and love is now, as great as all of that is, it is but a fraction of what is possible. Imagine how glorious the real thing is. Imagine worship there. And it's hard not to be motivated to make every decision you need to make to get there. This is why the best things on earth make us long for something more, and these reflections give us better hope for the future. I hope you see that. I hope you see the, the, that as good as this is, it's nothing. Nothing compared to the real thing. If you're not a child of God, 
you are putting at risk whether you will ever get to experience the real thing. Is that really a risk you want to take? You really just want the glimpses and that tiny mirror on the wall? That, that's the best you're ever going to get. That is the most heaven you will ever experience is the limited and small amount you will get here. That's all you want? Or do you want more? Because if you want more, all you got to do is commit yourself to Christ and be baptized to have your sins washed away and determined to pursue that real place with everything you got. I encourage you, if you've not done that, to do that tonight. If you need the invitation to be baptized into Christ and to start that walk toward the real thing, then come forward and let us know as we stand and sing this song.